you who are filtering in right now. Um, we'll just get started in a couple minutes. Give it, give it another minute to let some more people filter in. We can get started. Hey, cool. Should we go ahead and get started and we can just Let's do it. Awesome. So hi, everyone. I'm Johanna. I work in content at Branch and I'm here with Maude and Ethan and we'll be presenting to you today growth marketing in the modern world. Um, this session is about activation and retention. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is the last part of our four part webinar series. Um, it's based on a Stanford course that Maude and Ethan taught at Stanford. Um, and as I mentioned, today's topic is activation and retention. So I'll just go over a few housekeeping items before we start. So the audience is muted, but you'll be able to ask questions in the Q&A bar or in the chat box throughout the webinar. So we highly encourage those and we'll get to all questions um, at the end. Uh, this webinar is also being recorded, so you will receive this recording as well as all the other recordings for previous sessions that you might have missed um, tomorrow and we'll send out the slides as well. And yeah, with that, I'll hand it over to Mata. Thanks, Johanna. A little bit about me, for those of you who did not join the previous sessions, originally from Romania, I'm one of the founders and I lead marketing at Branch. Uh, my experience in growth is obviously working on driving growth at Branch, but also working on a consumer app before that and running marketing for it. Um, I also um, host this pod podcast called How I Grew This, and I took the slide from um, from the course. But actually, I think now we're about we've had about forty five guests uh, for the for the podcast. Awesome. And uh, yep. So I'm uh, Ethan Smith. I run a company called Graphite, which is a organic growth agency. And uh, I'm from Los Angeles. I uh, try to have a build habits in my life, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, later in the presentation, but uh, I like to wear the same clothes every day or not, not the exact same clothes, the same style of clothes every day. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm passionate about uh, helping companies grow. And so that's why uh, I started the company that, uh, that I work at now. And um, super excited to talk about activation and retention. So we'll start with activation. And just to give some context for where in the funnel and the life cycle uh, we're, we're focused on here. So <clears throat> this is uh, somewhat of a simplification, but uh, we're using the AARRR framework, which basically says you acquire people and then you activate and then you retain and then refer and revenue. So we, we chatted in, the, in a previous webinar about uh, acquisition. And so this is about once we've actually acquired people, how do we how do we get them to activate? And then ultimately, how do we get them to retain? And part of this is uh, based on what our North Star metric is. So ultimately, when we activate and when we retain, we're trying to push more of our uh, North Star metric. And so, uh, you know, depending on what the North Star metric is, activation is different. And uh, Sean Ellis talks a lot about uh, North Star metrics. So each company has a different, should have a different North Star metric. Ideally, that's something that's tied to user value and company value. So for something like uh, 
Twitter, that might be active users, whereas with Ticketmaster, it might be purchasing a ticket or buying a ticket. Uh, for something like Honey, it might be an extension install, which would be purchasing products. So each company has a different uh, North Star metric and then activation and retention is about pushing ultimately more of those North Star metrics. And so uh, for a masterclass, that would be activation means higher subscription rate or for Honey, it might be extension install rate or for Wish, it might be purchase rate. Um, and so, you know, before we actually work on activation, we want to make sure that we know uh, what exactly the North Star metric is so that we can activate a user to, to do more of that. Um, oops. So, you know, a quick example uh, to talk through is Yelp. And let's say that Yelp wants more active users or they want more people um, going to a restaurant or more people installing their app. And so, uh, you know, the, the user starts off by uh, searching for something like San Francisco restaurants, then they see a particular restaurant and then maybe they click save, maybe they click deliver, maybe they click um, uh, reservation and then a sign up uh, modal hits and then the user has a decision to make. And so this is a, 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 an activation flow for Yelp and we can break that down into a series of steps. And so we can think about each step in the funnel uh, and part of activation uh, as, um, as a series of decisions that the user makes. So, you know, a, a lot of times we talk about funnels, but each step in the funnel is actually a decision that is made by the user. And for something like sign up, that can mean we have a total number of users, how many people clicked on the sign up tr trigger, how many people actually uh, completed the sign up, and then that equals sign ups. But we can break that down into more granular details. So for something like click on the sign up button, we can distinguish between do they click on Facebook or Google or did they click on Apple or do they click on uh, email sign up? Uh, if they did click on email sign up, you know, there's a series of things that, that you, the user has to enter in. And each of those is a decision. So when, uh, you know, when deciding whether or not to sign up via email, I have to decide, should I enter my email? Should I enter a password? Each of these is a different decision that the user makes. And we can even potentially break that down into more granular things. So as I'm entering in my zip code, you know, there's a series of more specific uh, decisions that the user makes. The reason this is important is because if we want to act, uh, if we want to increase activation and we want to figure out where in the funnel uh, we have the most opportunity to increase things, break decisions down. And then as we're testing things, those tests can be specific to the decisions that the user is making as opposed to guessing and using intuition. So, uh, you know, when thinking about uh, activation, one thing that we also wanna think about is, is our current activation actually good? So is our sign up rate good? Is our extension slow rate good? And the way to think about what good or not good is, is how does it compare to uh, other categories or, uh, or, or uh, other products? So if we already have the highest signup rate of anyone, then maybe we shouldn't work on that. Maybe we should work on something else. And so if we can get actual data to inform what are the, uh, what are the upper bounds of what signup rate could be for a Yelp, uh, we can look at different categories. So we can look at marketplaces, we can look at fashion brands, um, Activation definitely depends on the category and, and, and the product being sold. So this is an example of an analysis that we could do where we could say, if I'm a retailer, let's say my conversion rate is 1.2%, but the average for other retailers is 3.7%. So my you know, potential upper bound is, uh, is to get from 1.2 to 3.7. So my opportunity is, is roughly a 200% increase in uh, sign up rate. But, um, then, when, then the question is where specifically within sign up is there opportunity? And so, you know, again, breaking down sign up into a series of smaller sub decisions. Uh, there's clicking on the sign up trigger, there's clicking on the sign up button, there's completing a sign up. And even if my sign up rate isn't as high as it could be, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that people aren't clicking on the trigger. So, in this uh, hypothetical example, these, these are not real numbers, but, you know, if, if we were working with Yelp, let's say that, the, that these were the numbers, we want to not only consider the sign up rate, but uh, in, in this example, Yelp is getting many clicks on the sign up, but the completion is lower. So rather than focusing on getting more people initiating a sign up, uh, we actually need to then go instead on the sign up page and figure out why are people not completing sign up. And if we did complete, uh, if, if we did improve that, um, then the upper bound of that could be 48%. So, you know, a question is how do we actually get these numbers? <clears throat> and so 
Some of these numbers are available uh, publicly. I, I know the branch has some stuff, not on sign up rate, but on some other parts of activation. Um, but another way that you can do that is to just identify specific companies that are doing uh, similar things and you know talk to the product manager who's working on sign up rate at, at, a, at a Zagat or at a TripAdvisor and ask them. And it may or may not be open to that, but many times they are. And so if you can get more and more data, then you can understand where exactly is the opportunity and be precise about where you're uh, increasing um, or, or where you're focusing your testing efforts. And so, you know, I, I mentioned that uh, a funnel can also be a series of decisions. And each of those decisions can also be thought of as a cost benefit analysis. And so users will make an assessment about what is the benefit of this particular decision or what is the cost? And small changes in that equation can tip a user to signing up or not signing up. So if you think about signing up for Yelp, the user's deciding, should I put my zip code in? And the decision for that is uh, on the benefit side, uh, you know, I can save a restaurant that I like, maybe I want to get delivery, maybe, maybe I want to be able to save my preferences, uh, maybe I have, there's special access to features that, that I don't get when I sign up. And so those are all the benefits that I can get uh, as part of weighing my decision. Uh, as part of weighing the cost, then there's, you know, what if I'm giving my personal information to Yelp? Uh, is there a concern there? Or, um, you know, I, there's effort to actually going through this whole flow. Do I want to go through this effort to do that? Uh, what if I move? Is Yelp going to know that? What's going to happen? And so all of these are weighing in my mind to whether or not I actually want to do this, uh, complete this zip code form, complete this whole sign up flow. And so we can make small tweaks to this equation. Uh, when we're trying to increase activation uh, to see if we can get an increase in conversion. So for something like zip code, maybe we can uh, increase the perceived benefit with value statements. So if we know that a user wants to get um, you know, deals or, or, or discover local restaurants, that's a benefit. And so we could highlight that benefit as part of zip code. And now the equation has changed and now more users are gonna uh, enter in their zip code and now more users are gonna sign up. Um, on the other side, we can potentially reduce some of the perceived cost. So if the user has concerns, like what are you doing with my personal information? We can address that and say, we're not gonna share that. And so all these small little tweaks to the cost benefit equation are ways that we can uh, try to tip more and more users into completing uh, each of these steps. And every single form on this page, we can do the exact same thing, just like we can for sign up overall. Um, these are all cost benefit analyses and decisions that a user is making. So, you know, when we're, when we're generating ideas for how we're actually going to, uh, what we're going to test, um, part of that can be via a, a brainstorm and, and via intuition, but part of that can also be actual frameworks. And so one of the frameworks that uh, we like a lot is the uh, Cialdini's uh, Six Principles of Persuasion. And so these are uh, principles that have been tested uh, rigorously uh, from academics. So there's, there's some... Uh, basis for why we would actually use these strategies as opposed to intuition where you know that may or may not actually be effective. So these things we know actually work in many different uh, cases. And so very briefly, you know, the reciprocity, which is I did this for you, you should do that for me. Commitment is you said you were going to do this thing, you have to follow through with what you're going to do. Social proof is other people are doing this. So that uh, so, so I should probably do it too. There's some validation of that. Liking is um, uh, Somebody is similar to me is doing the same thing. Authority doesn't really apply in this particular case, but scarcity definitely does. So there's, you know, there's only so many Airbnbs left. I have to make sure that I book something or else I won't ha have a place available. And so we can see these, uh, these uh, principles applied in a, in a bunch of different apps. Uh, Airbnb has done a lot of this. So uh, an example on, on the left is urgency. Um, there's only two hours left to book this place. And, and Airbnb is a really interesting case because there's actually scarce, uh, a scarce supply, uh, whereas you know, in other cases there's not. So for Airbnb, there, there are only so many places you can get. So you might not have that much time to book, which is urgency, or maybe it's scarce. This is a rare find, it's a special place. It's a tree house, it's an Airstream trailer. There aren't that many of them, so you need to make sure that you book. Um, the email uh, emails that they send after you after you stay at an Airbnb are really well done. And uh, they've tested these a lot and have really high uh, rates of reviews. And part of how they do that is uh, the host wrote a review about you. 
And so if the host wrote a re review about you, then you of course have to reciprocate by writing a review about the host. Uh, and uh, the host wrote something and they're not, we're not gonna tell you what it is until you write re your review, which is exciting and kind of mysterious. And also uh, by adding the photo and including the name of the person, then you have some sort of rapport with that person and uh, liking is uh, you know, another, uh, another principle that applies here. Uh, a few other examples. So uh, your classes are waiting. This is copy that performs really well uh, across many different categories. Your, your, the conversion that you want is waiting. There's some urgency to, to complete the, the whole flow. Um, Amazon and, and a lot of commerce uh, companies uh, have done a bunch of testing around stars. Stars always is helpful when, uh, when you're trying to decide whether or not to buy a product because if a bunch of other people have bought it and had a good experience, then you probably will as well. Um, on the right is a, uh, is an exit intent survey, which is you're going through a flow and maybe you're halfway through getting a quote on Thumbtack, but you want to exit out. And so we can say, are you sure you, you did all this work? You told us the type of uh, plumber that you want. Uh, if you leave, we're going to, we, we, we won't be able to save all that. And you, you started this flow. So shouldn't you can continue with that flow? Um, sunk cost is, is not part of the principles, but it's an interesting other um, known tested uh, concept in behavioral economics, where if you've actually done some amount of work, you don't, uh, you don't want to uh, leave, you've sunk some costs and you don't want to lose out on that. And so that's another way where we can get proven uh, strategies to, uh, to persuade people to change their decisions and, and continue with, uh, with the flow. Um, so uh, moving kind of past just sign up to we want the user to do something important, which is going to cause them to come back. And so a common example is the Facebook 10 friends example where Facebook found that uh, if uh, users add 10 friends within the first seven days, I think, then uh, they're more likely to come back. And so the new user experience is all about pushing that specific action. Um, another example is with Medium. And so after you've actually signed up, then we get you to do a series of steps like uh, favoriting specific categories or enabling push. and then uh, looking at your personalized feed and your personalized feed perhaps is something that, uh, that is, uh, something that will cause you to come back. You actually consume that kind of like the Facebook 10 friends example, uh, with Pinterest, they've done a lot of work around pushing you to get the first pin. And so not only, after, not only do they push you to sign up, but after you sign up, favoriting specific themes, viewing your personalized feed, getting content relevant to you, and then ultimately pinning something. And if you pin something, you're more likely to, to retain. Um, so, you know, after we've uh, defined the specific action that we that we care about when we're activating you, then we also need to know how many of those actions are important and what's the and how fast do you need to do that. So, for a messaging app, uh, yes, we want you to message someone, but maybe we need to have you send a, a larger number of messages. So, this is an example from uh, Mode, but um, you know, for a hypothetical messaging app, let's say that. Uh, the analysis showed that if you send one message that many of those people will not retain. But if you send eight messages or more messages, you're more active, you're, you're, you're talking to more people, now you're more, more likely to be retained. And so we wanna use data to inform how many of these actions are we actually pushing you to do. So this is uh, again, a hypothetical example, but we can do an analysis like this where we say, uh, not only uh, you sent a message, but what is the number of messages that correlates with retention the most? And we'll see that at, you know, once you get to around eight messages or so, you're 90% more, 90% uh, likely to retain versus one message where many of those people will not retain. And so uh, we can basically break this out once we've defined uh, that specific action to say, what is the total number of times you need to do that action? And then last, uh, so, Last is just showing a few examples of some of those aha moments. And again, the aha moment is something that correlates with a uh, high retention and then hopefully will also cause that high retention. So for Facebook, adding 10 friends, for Uber, scheduling a ride, having a good experience for DoorDash, um, ordering food, again, having a great experience on DoorDash, pushing for that first pin. These are all the specific action post signup that uh, we wanna activate the user in order to get them to be retained. So I think, um, let me share the screen.
So I think as, as Ethan said, when you think about activation, one of the most important parts of activation is actually this idea of doing a good onboarding. And onboarding is really your first interaction with the user, or maybe not the exact first interaction, but the first time you're actually kind of like starting to build that relationship. So the way we do onboarding is incredibly important. So uh, when I like to talk about onboarding and about this idea of convincing someone to do something, I like to refer to something called the, as the Fox behavioral model. And what this model says is that you actually only have two levers to convince someone to do something. One is their motivation and increasing their motivation. And the other one is making it easy or their ability to do something. The higher the motivation that the user has, the more likely they are to go through multiple hoops. And even if it's something hard, if they have hard motivation, they'll actually do it. But then the, you know, the, um, the lower the motivation, uh, the easier it has to be for them to do it. And I think when you think about building your onboarding, or getting someone to convert um, to something, I think you have to think about those triggers and what's the, you know, you and you can measure this. You can see what is the threshold at which depending on the motivation of a specific user, something is easy enough to them for them to do it. And as you think about pulling those two levers, obviously on the motivation side, you can give incentives, you can make your products more desirable, you can build, you can build like uh, awareness around your product and make it cool. But then the other one that you have is really this idea of making it simple. Even if the motivation is maybe not that high, if something is really easy to do, a user will end up doing it. So I think a lot of what I'll talk about in the next few slides on onboarding is really around like this trigger of likability and making something easier to do. So one of the first things, and I think people asked me this in some of the previous um, webinars, is this idea when someone sees an ad or someone is taken, um, uh, sees a, a promotion for your app, should you always take them to the app store? Should you take them to download the app? And in some cases, that might be too hard. If someone doesn't have enough motivation to use our product to buy something, taking them to an app store from an ad or from a promotion might be too hard for them. And it makes sense if they have the app to actually open the app. But if they don't have the app, it might be better to take them to a web version of that so they see a preview and only later try to convert them into an app users to banners, etc. The other thing as you think about your onboarding is really this thinking of onboarding as a form of orientation. Um, building experiences that re relate directly to user flows and something that user is trying to do. So if you know the intention of the user and we've talked about intent in the SEO uh, version of, in, in the organic um, webinar, I think if you understand their intent, make sure that the onboarding is really around that intent and it's not trying to show them all the things that your app can do or your product can do. They have nothing to do with their initial intent. So, you know, bringing the intent, if you know it, as a parameter or something that can be queried in the app and using that to create personalized and different onboarding experiences can work really, really well for your user. The other one thing that you should think when you think about uh, onboarding is really this idea of like the number of screens that you show a user and making sure that you limit those number, those screens and you don't show them too much. If they have something in mind, they're trying to do something and then you spend too much time, you know, showing them around your app and having them understand what the user, what, what all the things you can do, you might think you're doing a good thing because then they'll understand everything your app can do. But it's actually quite detrimental and you might see drop off and frustration because the users can't get to the thing that they're trying to do because you show too many screens and you might lose them forever. Again, the onboarding is like the first few dates uh, that you have if you're in a romantic relationship. I like to compare the relationship with the user with the relationship with significant other and if you, if you come out too strong and you show too much, you might lose them. The other one interesting thing that you can do is this idea that the sharing um, upfront why you need a certain type of information. So um, you, you, in some cases, you have to ask for information in the onboarding flow. But one thing, if you do that, ask, telling them why you're asking for the information and why you need it is incredibly important. Important. There's this psychology report, and uh, there was a study where they actually asked 
they made people go to people in line and make an ask. And some people just made the ask and others made the ask giving a reason that was very simple and others gave a reason that was more complicated. What they found at the end of that study that is that when the reason was given, whether it was simple or more complicated, people were way more likely to actually do the ask than when people just asked without giving a reason. And then the other important thing here is when you build an onboarding flow, in addition to intent, if you need to show a user screens, focus just on essential functionality and don't go too far beyond that. Just show them the things they need to do the basics in the app. And then throughout their experience later, show them other things. Um, so start, start with the very essentials and don't overwhelm them. The other thing that here, you know, we've talked about this in some of the other um, our other webinars, but this idea that uh, you can leverage web to app to convert users um, for activation. So you might, you know, acquire the users on the mobile web and activate them to the app through a banner. And the most interesting, the interesting thing here is don't show them the same thing, but actually. Uh, become be understand the intent of the user and make sure you pass that intent through the app. Um, so you know this is an example of the iconic, and they they do not show the banner right at the beginning, which I think is really important. Um, they but once someone starts browsing and they find a pair of shoes, they show a little banner, it's half page that someone can dismiss on or go through it, and if they go through it, they actually keep the intent and they take them to the same shoes that they were seeing on the website inside the app so the user can actually buy uh, those exact same shoes. The other interesting thing that people, I've seen people do here, because people convert into so much better in the app, I was just in on all hands for branch and we had the customer come and they were saying that when they first started testing app versus web, they just couldn't believe, they thought that their numbers were wrong and they had to run them twice because the app converts so much better. So, you know, you could also use, pull the motivation lever. So we've had companies that when they show banners on the mobile website, they don't just say, they don't just show a banner saying, go get the app. They say, if you get the app, you're gonna get 15, 20, 30% off of this particular item. So that increases the motivation uh, because, you know, downloading an app can be hard. Um, so, and then they, they have the user that has downloaded and bought in the app and they become, they're more likely to convert again and be a retained user. This is another example of things you can test. Nerd Wallet, uh, who has completely different uh, banners depending on the page that you're up. Um, and uh, this is something that, as you think about your users, uh, trying to test multiple things here can be very interesting and important. Uh, and then, you know, we talk a lot about personalization and why it's important and why going with intent and trying to understand what the user wants. Uh, so this is an example of something that we have data on, but I think this is something that you can test on your own in other places. But we tested um, around our banners from web to web, how much personalization actually uh, helps. So we looked at uh, people who just use our banners and make no changes. They just use a small banner everywhere, same thing. And that's the static baseline. And then we compare to people that maybe make may have two or three banners, very, very little personalization, but some personalization, right? Like maybe if you come from Google, you have a small banner. And then if you come from an email, a big banner. And then, then we compared to those customers that actually put a lot of effort into personalizing and showing their customers, depending where they come from, different messaging, different banners, et cetera. And you see that the difference is actually stark. Um, people who have done a lot of analysis and a lot of, um, uh, they, they really they really use the full functionality in personalizing the experience have more than five times um, the view to install, uh, view to click rate for their banners. So um, I think this is this is one example that we had data, but I think this this can play into everything that you do from onboarding to the way you show ads. The more personalized you make something and the more like you understand their intent, the more likely you are to actually activate that user. And with that, we'll move into something that's very tied to activation, which is retention. And before I, I, I before I pass it to Ethan, I think one thing to really think about retention, uh, is uh, this idea that before, you know, and we've done this like mobile growth handbook and we had this um, 
this flow, which was acquire, uh, engage, retain, and then turn them into advocates. And this year, uh, as we started doing roundtables and talking to people, I was just doing a wine event last night, a virtual wine event. And everyone was like, retention is the most important thing for us. And what's really interesting is that you would think retention is just big for maybe companies that are struggling with COVID, but it's actually quite the opposite. The retention is important for everyone. Companies that are struggling with COVID are focusing on retention of their current users and then reactivating them in the future. But companies who are doing really, really well, like food delivery companies, are very worried that as COVID starts winding down and people start eating outside again, they're going to lose the customers they acquired during this time. So they're also super focused on retention. News companies, I remember someone from Twitter saying the same thing, they're getting a lot of new users because you know people are home, they're bored, they're trying new things, and they're worried that those users are not going to be retained after things go back to normal. So they're also focusing on retention. So regardless of how how impacted you've been, it seems like retention has become top of mind for everyone. And this feels like the mobile growth framework now starts with retention across all the other channels. So at every point in the user's journey, the companies are thinking about retention first. Um, and I think when we think about retention in today's world, we've seen retention, as I said, more important. Uh, a lot of our respondents, when we do the survey, said the same thing. Um, and they really feel that this is the new normal and retention really is uh, number one. Uh, and, and right now it's a crucial time to keep users informed and entertained when you think about retention. So if, if you can't offer them your product, you can still build a relationship with them. So I think this idea of relationship building as part of retention is also really important. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to Ethan who's gonna talk about retention lifecycle framework. Awesome, thanks, Mara. So uh, yeah, as Mara mentioned, uh, retention we'll see over and over again is probably the most important part of your growth funnel. Um, if you acquire users and you don't activate them and, and you don't retain them, then you have to keep on buying more ads and getting more uh, people coming in and you keep burning them. And so focusing on retention is probably the most important thing. Um, when thinking about retention, we want to think about the different states of the user throughout their life cycle. So, you know, first they start as a new user, then we activate them as we discussed earlier. So now they're a current user. Um, and then ultimately we, we want to push them to become a power user. So somebody who's coming back many times, they've built a habit around the app, they're ordering from DoorDash every single week or every single day, and they're a power user. But a lot of times users do not become that power user. So they might, uh, they might churn. Uh, and then when they churn, you know, we can potentially resurrect them or we might lose them forever. But each of these different states, there's a specific set of uh, uh, directions that a user can go in. And we want to track all of our users and put them in these different buckets because the strategy to activate is very different from the strategy to reactivate. And the strategy for resurrecting is very, you know, also very different from activation. And so we want to have specific strategies for each state of these users uh, so that we can, again, push people ultimately back into uh, becoming a power user. <laughs> And uh, we talked at the beginning about activating users and pushing them to perform a specific action like their first pin or uh, adding 10 friends or ordering something from DoorDash, having great experience. And that be, uh, helps them become that, that current user. But for many of the states, it's about you acquired someone, they, you got them to do an action, but they left for some reason. And so a large part of retention is how do we get people to come back? And uh, you know, follow-up question to that is what is good retention? So if our retention is 10% or 20%, is that good or is that not good? And so similar to when we talked about the different benchmarks for, for sign up rate, we can do the exact same thing for, for retention. So good retention is a relative uh, term. So, uh, you know, a study that uh, Andrew Chen posted <clears throat> was that uh, the average app loses 77% of its DAUs in the first three days. So 77% of all of your users left and they're not coming back, which is a huge number of people. And uh, if you actually look at some of the better apps, they have significantly higher retention. And so the curve for the top 10 apps, this red curve, you'll see if you extend that over time, you're going to have way more users. Whereas the green curve, um, you're churning a, a large number of your users. And 
uh, it's really hard to retain people, or sorry, it's really hard to, to, to uh, resurrect users once they've churned. And so having strong early retention is super important. And um, similar to uh, similar to sign up rate, it's relative. So certain categories are going to have higher retentions on average than others. Enterprise SaaS is going to have a much higher retention. Consumer social is going to have a lower retention. So if, if we're comparing our retention versus others, we want to make sure that we're comparing it uh, against a similar categories so that it's a fair comparison. Um, this is a study that uh, Lenny uh, from uh, who used to work at Airbnb posted. And uh, we talked before about the, the hypothetical case of the messaging app. So yes, we want you to send a message, but we need you to send a certain number of messages, like eight messages. With Facebook, yes, we want you to add, add a friend, but you need to add 10 friends. And so then the other thing to consider is what is the, the, uh, the frequency of actually doing that? And so Mata mentioned the case of ordering food. Uh, in the past, ordering food may have been something you did once a month, whereas now it can be something that you, you might do once a day or even multiple times per day versus buying a car. And so a Carvana or a shift, uh, you might buy a car every 10 years or 20 years. And so understanding how often uh, is it realistic to expect a user to, to uh, use uh, your product is super important. And so you can kind of answer that by just observing how often the users actually, uh, for, for eating food, how often do you eat? And you eat multiple times a day versus, you know, again, a car you, you, you do uh, infrequently. And so defining that uh, use case frequency spectrum is super important so that you know uh, what your goal should be. And uh, we wanna push again, more users, we've, we've acquired them, we've activated them, we wanna push more of them to become power users. One of the best ways is to focus on engagement. And so there's a few different ways to think about engagement. One of the ways that I like is the uh, habit framework, which uh, is spoken about in, in this book, Power of Habits. Um, but uh, any habit can be shaped. So, uh, the, you know, we can get people to become a power user, but we need to create a habit and any, any of these habits can be shaped or reshaped. And the main way to think about that is that there's a cue, a reward, and then that becomes a routine. So there's a specific cue. Uh, one of the examples they give in the book that I like is about exercise. So what are the cues for why you would want to exercise? Uh, leaving your shoes next to the front door or setting an alarm or finding a friend. Um, all of these are cues to do the uh, activity that you want to become a habit. Then once you do the activity, there needs to be some sort of a reward. So after you complete, after you finish exercising, maybe you get you know, some food that you like or uh, you get to watch a TV show that you want to watch. Um, and then as you have these cues and these rewards, now a habit is built. And you are able to do this more and more. And now you can make sure that uh, exercising is routine and we can apply the same framework to apps and websites. So um, building on the uh, exercise example for Fitbit, uh, they do a really good job of, of sending these uh, interesting cues. So uh, they have this 10,000 step goal and uh, they can cue you, you're almost there. And once you're there, you can say, congratulations, you did it. Or your Fitbit might vibrate. And so you get this reward. Uh, I know that my mother really is super excited every time she gets her 10,000 steps, she gets this reward, which makes her way more excited to, uh, to get her 10,000 steps the next day. Uh, with uh, Instagram, you know, when, when, you, when you post a photo, you want your friends to like it. So you post a photo, your friends like it, uh, you, you are excited about that reward. Now I'm more likely to want to post yet another photo. And uh, this is super effective for, for Instagram. Um, for Netflix, maybe you liked a particular show like Orange is the New Black. When the new season is out, come and watch it. Or maybe you watch the first three episodes and you want to watch the fourth episode. Uh, Netflix can trigger that back and then you get your reward of watching the, the show that you like. And so all of these examples are about apps proactively triggering you, uh, getting you to do this action and then rewarding you once you've done that, which then builds this uh, habit loop, which then turns you into a power user, power user who's hopefully ordering from DoorDash every day or every other day rather than once a month. And uh, I will uh, send it over to Mata. I think you're on mute, Mata. Can you just, oh, I can go. Can you just show the screen? I'll, I'll, sure. You just want the only a slide or two. Yep. Uh, so this is just an example of a case study uh, around engaging and retaining. 
with Testbook. Uh, that's a that's a that's a company that uses Branch. Um, so this is an example of people sending emails uh, to retain users, but then making sure that the experience around you know when they actually send the email takes users to the same thing in the email. So using using content here to re-engage users, and this is in this particular case is actually sending them exam specific study material that they can see in the app or reminding them and then and, and basically building those cues um, through email. If you go to the next slide. So when you think about the engaging and retending, content is actually a really good way um, to do that. And I think during COVID, we've seen some companies who were actually really good at doing this and got very creative. Um, with ad, with ad spend that was cut, especially in the early days of COVID or on hold, creating content became more cost effective and drove organic traffic, but also drove a way to re-engage your users. I saw some examples of companies who, you know, maybe were shut down during this time, uh, restaurants, and they were like sending um, recipes to the users to keep the restaurant uh, top of mind or a gym who was closed and couldn't get visitors, but became viral because they had videos of the penguin going and looking at all the other animals. And they got people to continue keeping the zoo top of mind and making sure that they, they you know, they're building this like um, desire to return and see the zoo once things go back to normal. We did a mobile growth survey earlier this year. Oh, sorry, go to the back. Uh, and, and some of the respondents of the survey what are some of the things that they said that they're doing with content to retain users? Uh, they're doing educational and informational content and moment of esca escapist delight. That was something that Tradesy was doing. Um, a lot of some other companies uh, started sharing COVID-19 related content to support their, their users in this, case, uh, in this case, how they can support moms for mindful mamas. Karibu created content focused on how to handle social distancing. Um, and uh, fits frames creating campaign on eye health and how can you maintain eye health while working from home and look at the screen for so long. Uh, you know, as you think about what should your content be, especially around orientation, adapting content on what users are looking for, not what's not, not what's like necessarily just promoting your brand and creating actionable content, um, but also creating fun, engaging things that users can kind of escape with. And uh, the last tip around this is, this is a good time um, to um, increase the volume of our content. I apologize, I have two dogs with me that are playing. Um, so you wanna go to the next slide. So the other thing that's I think really important during this time, and I think as we think about, um, I think, I think it was I think about COVID, a lot of people are struggling, right? Not everyone is struggling. I think the economies don't always show it. A lot of people are losing their jobs, and there's. I think it's important to to start with empathy and show empathy during this time. I think when you think about promotions, having promotions that show empathy are really important, and and really putting yourself in the mindset of the customer. I think you know um, companies sometimes go through layoffs, and I think just trying to like be mindful of that when you try to sell to your customers in, in B two B is incredibly important. Uh, providing some products for free for a period of time for users that you know are actually heavily impacted financially by COVID could be something that you should keep in mind and test. But, but when you do that, it's important to make it very clear that this is a temporary thing and, and have a limit. Once you give something to someone for free, it's hard to charge after unless you set that expectation head on. Uh, the other thing around empathy is like, I think it does, when you show empathy, it goes a long way. And I'll give you an example uh, for me. Uh, when I started Branch, I had no money and I couldn't afford to get haircuts. So my hairdresser gave me free haircuts. Um, eight years later, I moved away from San Francisco and I live in the South Bay. But uh, every two months I drive to San Francisco to get a haircut from her because uh, her, her, um, understanding and showing empathy when I went through a hard time built like incredible loyalty. And I have a feeling that like, even if I move away, I'll probably still get haircuts when I come back to the Bay Area, just because of the loyalty that I built. Uh, and then the last thing is like, you can focus on pain points as the result of the pandemic, but focusing on pain points without fixes doesn't make a lot of sense. So if there are solutions that you can offer your users on how they can improve their lives, I think they could work really well. So next slide. 
Uh, and then the last, you know, the last point I'll make here is um, app is a great retention channel. And I think what we've seen at Branch is that during this time, uh, everyone started focusing a lot more on, on the app and companies that for which app was more like an afterthought than it was something that was owned by maybe an agency are bringing those in house and are spending a lot of time pushing users to the app. One of our products that I think used to be used just in Asia was QR codes. And we see so many of our customers now using the QR code feature to get people to download their app, to take users to their app um, and to so they can engage with them better. So I think with that, pass it back to you, Ethan. Awesome, thanks, Mara. So, um, you know, let's say that we, we acquired users, we activate them and, and then they churn. And now we need to resurrect them. And this is not the ideal state because it's actually harder a lot of times to resurrect someone than it is to activate them as a new user. And so ideally, we've once we've activated them early on, we can push them into the power user state. But a large portion of your users are actually going to be churned. And so there, there's also a lot of opportunity to resurrect those users and, and then bring them back uh, to, to eventually become power users. And so uh, Amplitude's uh, done some studies on this, but uh, it's, it's uh, potentially the largest number of uh, users is your churn users. So an app uh, that's you know required millions of installs, ultimately uh, there's not enough new people to, to get you to uh, install the app that you haven't already uh, reached or haven't already acquired. And so now uh, churn users is actually your, your largest potential user base. And usually when a user's churned, they've used a different app instead of your app. So it's a user who has very high intent, but they're using a competitor's product instead of your own product. And so it's a super valuable user. And so it's, it's important to, to focus on it. And uh, we want to ask the question, why do users churn? So back to some of the previous um, slides about decisions, the user made a decision to churn. And uh, we don't want to just send emails and push notifications and hope people will open them and come back. We want to understand the root cause of why they churned and then address that specifically. So some of the reasons why a user might churn, probably the, the biggest is because you didn't have product market fit. So the product wasn't the right product in the first place. You didn't offer enough value. Maybe you offered some value, but your competitor offered even more value. But there's something wrong with the product. If there's something wrong with the product, Emails and push notifications won't solve that. You need to understand what's missing and get better product market fit so that you can now uh, get users to come back. Um, another uh, potential reason why pe people might churn is the, the product is great, it has product market fit, but you're not activating the user. And so some of the stuff that we talked about previously, maybe uh, if, if, if Pinterest didn't push to the first pin, even if it's a great product, uh, you're losing out on users because you didn't get them to do an action that will cause them to come back. And so making sure that you activate that that new user uh, and you're finding the right aha moment is super important. Um, usage frequency. So uh, going back to the car example or maybe uh, shipping um, shipping things or, or going on vacation, it's possible that uh, it's just not an action that people do that often. Um, cost is another example. So uh, it, it may be that, you know, uh, one of the yet new video platforms that's, that's uh, launching uh, has great content, but it's just too expensive. It doesn't make sense to have another subscription. Um, bugs is actually an, an interesting example. So the product might be great, but it might just be breaking a lot, uh, especially for new products that haven't been around very long. Uh, a lot of times there are bugs. And so people just get frustrated and they leave and they go use another product instead of instead of your product. And then the last is that you're, you're not acquiring the right users. <clears throat> so your product might be great and your activation funnel might be great, but you're just getting users who didn't want to uh, to buy your product in the first place or didn't want to subscribe or, or didn't want to install the extension. They, they, they just weren't that interested. So in that particular case, I think it's actually fine if those users churn, you probably just want to shift your, uh, shift your acquisition strategy to acquire users who actually do have that intent. And so how do we actually know which of those things is the cause for why users are churning? And so there's a, there's a few different methods for, for each, there's a different method. So for product market fit, you can ask things like net promoter score. There's a lot of other uh, ways you can assess product market fit, but um, you can actually measure that and then assess what is it missing, what is missing in our product, and then try to uh, add that back and then get a, a better uh, net promoter score and thus product market fit. Uh, on the activation side, that's pretty straightforward to measure. So you can measure, uh, as we described earlier, very, very precisely 
how many users uh, triggered to sign up on Yelp, how many clicked a particular uh, authentication method, and then ultimately how many people completed that. So that's pretty easy to, to measure. Um, usage frequency, so we can look at similar products. If you're buying a car, how often do people buy cars on other platforms? And now Carvana can say, what should our usage frequency be? Similar with Airbnb, how often do people stay at hotels? And that frequency is now a frequency that's relevant for, for Airbnb. Um, the bug site is uh, actually pretty interesting. So uh, we can actually look, uh, users are very vocal when they don't like something. And we can look at things like customer support, tickets, uh, tweets, reviews. There's quite a lot of information about users saying what they don't like. And uh, if we can summarize all of that, then we can basically go through priority order and fix those. And fixing bugs is one of the less exciting uh, things to work on, but it, it can actually be quite impactful. And so I think that it's, it's important to not uh, undervalue how important it is to, to have a bug, uh, bug free experience for users. And then on a low intent users, um, if a bunch of people are coming to your website or your app and leaving, it might be hard to know whether or not it was the content or whether or not they just weren't interested, but we can do things like surveys. We can do screen recording if they landed and immediately left, that's probably low intent. And so all these uh, methods can tr try to suggest why exactly are users churning. And then once we know why, then we can have strategies specific to that, that reason. Um, and you know, resurrection is a really high impact way to increase retention on apps. So uh, many of the acquisition channels that apply also apply to resurrection. So for email, Uber Eats uh, has these really good uh, emails where maybe you, you built a habit of around ordering from Uber Eats and you switch to DoorDash, Uber Eats can send me an email uh, giving me more benefit. So giving me $20 off or some sort of benefit for why I would want to use Uber Eats rather than DoorDash. Push notifications is obviously a really good strategy. So for MyFitnessPal, going back to the habit uh, framework can can remind you, you know, you didn't log your breakfast or you didn't get 10,000 steps or you didn't do, you didn't complete the, uh, the habit uh, that you were doing before and you should, and here's why. And here's a cue for that. Um, ads, obviously retargeting is super, super effective and then organic. So, uh, for uh, houses is a perfect example. You only buy a house every 20 years, but organic is a great way to get people to come back. If you actually show up in Google and somebody's looking to buy uh, a house or uh, looking to sell a house, if we show up in Google, then we can retain users. And for companies like Zillow and Yelp, SEO is actually one of the largest uh, retention channels for them. The other thing, as you think about acquisition and retention, I think one thing as you think about retention is that's important to understand that retention is not the same for all your users, depending on where you acquire them. So we did an analysis looking at branch links at all the different acquisition channels and what the retention percentage is for all of them. And you see quite a different 30-day uh, retention here, right? So the way you can measure retention is by seven days, 14 days, 21 days, 28 days. Some people, you can even do it for longer than that. But at, the, at day 28, we saw that there was quite a stark difference from people that were acquiring to the app from your banners on your website to referrals. And the people who come from ads had actually the lower retention. Obviously, this is something that is across a lot of different apps and it might be different for yours, but I think it is very important that you understand your retention depending on your channel. Um, and uh, you can do this quite easily if you're using branch with your the cohort analysis where you can group people by the acquisition channel and then look at their retention over time. Uh, so, you know, if we go through retention tactics round down uh, that both Ethan and I have talked about, make onboarding super easy, define and track your LTV and reassess your channels and really understand what your uh, retention and LTV is by channel, get push notifications right, bring personalization to every aspect of your customer communication from onboarding to email to uh, push to everything else. You can use referrals as a re-engagement strategy Getting people to like reinvite and, and engage with other users can be very a very good way to re-engage your users. Uh, A/B testing, testing and measuring all your messaging, all your onboarding, the channels. I think makes uh, it's incredibly important. And then using the app um, as uh, a good retention channel, understanding that users who actually use your app and engage with you in the app are twice as likely 
to be retained than people than your users who are just on your website. So final tips and reminders. If you're growing, take advantage of a temporary spike and build loyalty and retaining these customers long term. So focusing on retention, focus on retention now before things, you know, kind of go back to normal. And if your traffic is lower, this is the time to really focus on that relationship building with your users uh, and prioritizing those relationships rather than revenue uh, to make sure that when things get back to normal, you haven't lost those users. So that's it for us today. Do you have, I know people have been asking questions. We see a few in Q&A, but if you have any additional ones, let us know. Um, so the first question, do you have tips for startups on which SaaS tools to use or how to use setup or your own tooling for running experiments and working on, on all these topics? Um, engagement, activation, conversion, uh, I think there, um, Ethan, do you have any thoughts on this? So I, most of my experience is on the consumer side, but um, on the web and app side for consumers and also for SaaS, um, similar uh, similar things for consumers. So the, the tools that I use the most are uh, things like Google Analytics or Mixpanel or Looker. Um, usually people will have a, an event tracking system that's Google Analytics, Mixpanel or custom, which then feeds into Looker or Tableau to, to visualize. Um, one of the challenges with SaaS is on attribution and omni-channel tracking. And then uh, the other thing is that for SaaS, typically a user is not ready the first time that they ever see your brand to spend $50,000 on, uh, you know, on Zendesk or $50,000 on SendGrid. They need to come, they need to be aware of the problem. They need to be aware of the brand. They need to come back. And that's hard to track every single one of those touch points and say which of the touch points, uh, what, what the weight of each touch point was that caused that. So usually what we'll do is we'll instead measure all of those touch points and we'll have to make some assumptions. But the tools are again, things like Google Analytics, Mixed Panel, Looker, custom tracking, stuff like that. And I think for, for specifically B2B, a good tool is Engageo uh, because you can actually um, use an account-based like um, approach to this where you have multiple users on one account. So you can get an engagement score for the user and an engagement score for an account. And you can set up um, time decay. So in our case, when we look at like the engagement of our, our users, customers, we look at like the last six months engagement and we have goals around this. Um, so after six months, you know, the, the, the touch that all the touches go back to zero. So it's important that we actually keep, to keep users engaged, we only look at like their score in the past six months and we've given every activity a score. So we use those, those to both actually uh, look at engagement and have goals around engagement, but we also have goals around, uh, around like pipeline. And when, when the pipeline gets generated, we look at like everyone who's on that opportunity and we break it down by their engagement to do the attribution. Um, let's see, can you share again some examples of referral as a re-engagement strategy? I think if you were uh, in our last uh, session on virality, we talked a lot about referrals. One, you know, really great example was the Robin Hood one, where someone um, would share something. And if someone came from that link and went and got Robin Hood, they got the stock, but also the person who first share got the free stock. So by them getting a notification that the person that they invited um, actually did something, they end up getting re-engaged uh, they go, they look at what stock they got, they got dopamine, and then they, they invite again, and they, or they might like buy more stock, etc. So in, in that particular case, it's not the actual referral, it's the double viral loop of like actually once a referral happens, bringing back the user back in to engage them and retain them. Uh, and then I see Matt mentioned that Headspace gave their app free to users who are unemployed. They show great empathy. The other example is also Masterclass. They give, gave Masterclass for only $1 for students and for people who were learning. I think that was also uh, an example of empathy during this time. And with that, I know we are on time. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Ethan, so much for, for your me. help with this. And um, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Have a great. Bye.